truth will set you free. Thank you so much for watching Thin Air Stuff, where I'm sure we're going to find the things that have vanished over time. Please subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, and give me five dollars and I'll bet your life. <laughs> Take care everyone, thanks again for watching. That necklace must be found and at once. I know, Lila, but how? Apparently they searched the place from stem to stern, even covered the grounds, just vanished into thin air. Thin air, I'll see you there, or at the judgment seat. You take good care, and be kind to others. Kim, what's on your radar? Well, the term mass formation psychosis trended over the weekend with so many searches it broke the internet. When people went to search for the term on Google, a couple of strange things happened. Some people saw this odd disclaimer from Google saying the results were changing quickly and that it would take time for results to be added by reliable sources. What does this even mean? I thought when you Googled something, it would bring up sites relating to the topic. Why would Google need time to add results by quote unquote reliable sources? Sounds like they're censoring search results. Well, a few hours later, when people searched for the term, a bunch of sites began to pop up claiming it was a new far right buzzword or one attributed to anti-vaxxers. Well, it's very difficult to find any information using Google. So I had to turn to DuckDuckGo in order to find any relevant information. So what is mass formation psychosis? Well, the term came recently from the Joe Rogan, Dr. Robert Malone interview that aired this past Friday, but was also heard and explained in more detail during Dr. Peter McAuliffe's interview with Rogan. We're in what's called a mass formation psychosis. This is very important. I give credit to Dr. Matthias Desmet in the University of Ghent in Belgium, and recently Dr. Mark McDonald, psychiatrist from L.A. Mark McDonald's got a new book out, The United States of Fear, describing how the mass psychosis developed. What your listeners need to know is a mass psychosis is when there is a groupthink that develops that's so strong that it leads to something horrific. And the examples are these mass suicides that occur in these religious cults. The example is Nazi Germany, when people walk into gas chambers and were gas. These horrific things. And, and four elements here. It's very important, Joe. First, there must be a period of prolonged isolation, lockdowns. Number two, there must be a, a, a withdrawal of things taken away from people that they used to enjoy. That's happened. Number three, there must be constant incessant free-floating anxiety, all this news cycle, all the, the deaths and the hospitalizations, more, more variant mutant strains, everything, people could be becoming scared over and over again. And the last thing, number four, the capper. The capper is there must be a single solution offered by an entity in authority. And in this case is clear. Worldwide, the solution was vaccination. Everybody must take the vaccination. It's not a U.S. program. It's not a European program. It's everywhere. And you know what, Joe? It doesn't matter what vaccine it is. It could be uh, Chinavac, Coronavac. It could be Novavax. It could be Pfizer, Moderna, J&J. &J. It's interesting that it doesn't even matter what vaccine it is. It's just take a vaccine, take any vaccine. And so what mass psychosis says is, number four, the solution, there's no limit to the absurdity of the solution. So Dr. McCullough attributes the idea to Dr. Matthias Desmet, a professor of clinical psychology at Ghent University in Belgium, one of the top universities in the world. The four conditions that lead up to mass formation psychosis result in people who are radically intolerant and people who are irrational in their solutions. So in regards to this pandemic, we're seeing this intolerance of the unvaccinated, where many people who consider themselves very open-minded or even quote-unquote woke are saying things they believe, are saying that they believe the unvaccinated should be removed from society in some way. So the most common way to remove the unvaccinated so far has been through requiring vaccine passports to enter restaurants, bars, movie theaters, malls, and other venues, requiring vaccine passports to work or even travel. So this is all done in an attempt to not only encourage people to get vaccinated, but also to reduce risk, which people believe is attributable to the unvaccinated. So there are a lot of people in society right now who I would consider to be radically intolerant of unvaccinated 
vaccinated people and will go to great lengths to stay away from them. And many people, like myself, believe their solutions are irrational. The virus seems to be spreading through vaccinated and unvaccinated populations alike, so segregating based on vaccination status doesn't make any sense to me. But let's talk about the four conditions that lead up to this point and other examples throughout history. The first condition is some sort of social isolation. So the social isolation can be a group that is isolated from society, like cults living out in the middle of nowhere, groups that are isolated from each other through segregation or apartheid, or groups within a society that don't intermingle, like cultural, ethnic, or religiously different groups. So the first condition is some sort of social isolation from others. Now, lockdowns and not having any social interaction with one another could also count in this category. The second condition is some sort of despair, loss of enjoyment, perceived negative change in lifestyle. Obviously, this entire pandemic has created a massive loss of enjoyment and severely shifted lifestyles for many. In the example of a religious cult, they think this earth life is undesirable and blame infidels or sinners or even just the human condition. In the example of segregated societies or societies that persecute different people, be they a different race, ethnicity, religion, or in the case of this pandemic, medically different, people feel a loss of something in their lives and blame these others for that loss. But basically, the second condition is life isn't so great and these others are to blame. The third condition is being in a constant state of fear, anxiety, or anger. And I think this one speaks for itself. When a person is in a constant state of fear, anxiety, fear or anxiety, they'll do anything to relieve that fear and anxiety. And the fourth condition is a leader or group of leaders who come along and say they have the solution to the fear and anxiety and can make things better. They offer a solution and the people become fixated and follow through with that solution, be it mass suicide, apartheid, genocide, forced religious conversions. These are the most extreme, but they're probably smaller, less obvious examples I would say mass incarcerations of black men in America is probably another example of this. Blacks and whites stayed largely segregated within society. There was a perceived erosion of safety in the community. Fear, anxiety, and anger resulted. And the leadership, Clinton and Biden in this case, came along with the solution of locking people up. Now, Trump's wall is another possible example. Americans are isolated from people south of our border. There has been a there's been some despair and a feeling of loss of the good life, fear, anxiety and anger resulted. And the solution was to build a wall and people became fixated on this solution. So the question is, do we think we're living in a mass formation psychosis under Fauci's leadership where the only solution is vaccination and only vaccination will save us from this pandemic? Are people following nonsensical guidance blindly? Well, I want to play this clip for you of Fauci on CNN's State of the Union. Tell me if this guidance makes sense. How should vaccinated and boosted people behave? Can they go into a restaurant, eat safely indoors right now? You know, when you're having such a, I call it a tsunami of infections, Dana, we are seeing people who are vaccinated and boosted who are getting breakthrough infections. So when you're in a situation where you have so many infections going out, the thing that you want to say is that if you want to do things like that, better do them in a setting where you know the people around you are vaccinated and boosted. So Fauci says fully vaccinated people are getting the virus, so only be around fully vaccinated people. <laughs> Rather than push back on this nonsense, Dana Bash just goes along with it. Doesn't, see, doesn't this seem like an example of what could be considered mass formation psychosis? So I'll ask you guys. I mean, a lot of this stuff is just no longer really making sense. We're still following Fauci's guidance. I'm kind of wondering why. Uh, but it, it does seem like about a third of the population is maybe, maybe, just maybe, under this mass formation psychosis. What do you think? I, well, I agree. I mean, I agree with you about, I don't like Dr. Fauci. I don't agree with his recommendations. I don't think the unvaccinated should be stigmatized. I don't think they should be, there should be mandates, lockdowns, all of that we agree on. The masses have never thirsted after truth. They turn aside from evidence that is not to their taste, preferring to deify error if error seduced them. Whoever can supply them with illusions is easily their master. Whoever attempts to destroy their illusions is always their victim. Diseases of the body can spread through a population and reach epidemic proportions. 
but so too can diseases of the mind. And of these epidemics of the latter variety, the mass psychosis is the most dangerous. During a mass psychosis, madness becomes the norm in a society, and delusionary beliefs spread like a contagion. But as delusions can take many forms, and as madness can manifest in countless ways, the specific manner in which a mass psychosis unfolds will differ based on the historical and cultural context of the infected society. In the past, mass psychoses have led to witch hunts, genocides, and even dancing manias. But in the modern era, it is the mass psychosis of totalitarianism that is the greatest threat. Totalitarianism, writes Arthur Verse Lewis, is the modern phenomenon of total centralized state power, coupled with the obliteration of individual human rights. In the totalized state, there are those in power, and there are the objectified masses, the victims. In a totalitarian society, the population is divided into two groups, the rulers and the ruled, and both groups undergo a pathological transformation. The rulers are elevated to an almost godlike status, which is diametrically opposed to our nature as imperfect beings who are easily corrupted by power. The masses, on the other hand, are transformed into the dependent subjects of these pathological rulers and take on a psychologically regressed and childlike status. Hannah Arendt, one of the 20th century's preeminent scholars of this form of rule, called totalitarianism an attempted transformation of human nature itself. But this attempted transformation only turns sound minds into sick minds, for as the Dutch medical doctor who studied the mental effects of living under totalitarianism wrote, there is in fact much that is comparable between the strange reactions of the citizens of totalitarianism and their culture as a whole, on the one hand, and the reactions of the sick schizophrenic on the other. The social transformation that unfolds under totalitarianism is built upon and sustained by delusions. For only deluded men and women regress to the childlike status of obedient and submissive subjects and hand over complete control of their lives to politicians and bureaucrats. Only a deluded ruling class will believe that they possess the knowledge, wisdom, and acumen to completely control society in a top-down manner. And only when under the spell of delusions would anyone believe that a society composed of power-hungry rulers on the one hand, and a psychologically regressed population on the other, will lead to anything other than mass suffering and social ruin. But what triggers the psychosis of totalitarianism? As was explored in the previous video of this series, the mass psychosis of totalitarianism begins in a society's ruling class. The individuals that make up this class, be it politicians, bureaucrats, or crony capitalists, are very prone to delusions that augment their power, and no delusion is more attractive to the power-hungry than the delusion that they can and should control and dominate a society. When a ruling elite becomes possessed by a political ideology of this sort, be it communism, fascism, or technocracy, the next step is to induce a population into accepting their rule by infecting them with the mass psychosis of totalitarianism. This psychosis has been induced many times throughout history, and as Mirlu explains, it is simply a question of reorganizing and manipulating collective feelings in the proper way. The general method by which the members of a ruling elite can accomplish this end is called menticide, with the etymology of this word being a killing of the mind, and as Mirlu further explains, menticide is an old crime against the human mind and spirit, but systematized anew. It is an organized system of psychological intervention and judicial perversion through which a ruling class can imprint their own opportunistic thoughts upon the minds of those they plan to use and destroy. Priming a population for the crime of menticide begins with the sowing of fear. For as was explored in the first video of this series, when an individual is flooded with negative emotions such as fear or anxiety, he or she is very susceptible to a descent into the delusions of madness. Threats real, imagined, or fabricated can be used to sow fear, but a particularly effective technique is to use waves of terror. 
Under this technique, the sowing of fear is staggered with periods of calm. But each of these periods of calm is followed by the manufacturing of an even more intense spell of fear. And on and on the process goes. Or as Mirlu writes, Each wave of terrorizing creates its effects more easily after a breathing spell than the one that preceded it because people are still disturbed by their previous experience. Morality becomes lower and lower, and the psychological effects of each new propaganda campaign become stronger. It reaches a public already softened up. While fear primes a population for menticide, the use of propaganda to spread misinformation and to promote confusion with respect to the source of the threats and the nature of the crisis, helps to break down the minds of the masses. Government officials and their lackeys in the media can use contradictory reports, nonsensical information, and even blatant lies, as the more they confuse, the less capable will a population be to cope with the crisis and diminish their fear in a rational and adaptive manner. Confusion, in other words, heightens the susceptibility of a descent into the delusions of totalitarianism. Or as Mirlu explains, Logic can be met with logic, while illogic cannot. It confuses those who think straight. The big lie and monotonously repeated nonsense have more emotional appeal than logic and reason. While the people are still searching for a reasonable counter-argument to the first lie, the totalitarians can assault them with another. Never before in history have such effective means existed to manipulate a society into the psychosis of totalitarianism. Smartphones and social media, television and the internet, all in conjunction with algorithms that quickly censor the flow of unwanted information, allow those in power to easily assault the minds of the masses. What is more, the addictive nature of these technologies means that many people voluntarily subject themselves to the ruling elite's propaganda with a remarkable frequency. Modern technology, explains Mirlu, teaches man to take for granted the world he is looking at. He takes no time to retreat and reflect. Technology lures him on, dropping him into its wheels and movements. No rest, no meditation, no reflection, no conversation. The senses are continually overloaded with stimuli. Man doesn't learn to question his world anymore. The screen offers him answers, ready-made. But there is a further step the would-be totalitarian rulers can take to increase the chance of a totalitarian psychosis, and this is to isolate the victims and to disrupt normal social interactions. When alone and lacking normal interactions with friends, family, and co-workers, an individual becomes far more susceptible to delusions for several reasons. Firstly, they lose contact with the corrective force of the positive example, for not everyone is tricked by the machinations of the ruling elite, and the individuals who see through the propaganda can help free others from the menticidal assault. If, however, isolation is enforced, the power of these positive examples greatly diminishes. But another reason that isolation increases the efficacy of menticide is because like many other species, human beings are more easily conditioned into new patterns of thought and behavior when isolated. Or as Mirlu explains with regards to the physiologist Ivan Pavlov's work on behavioral conditioning, Pavlov made another significant discovery. The conditioned reflex could be developed most easily in a quiet laboratory with a minimum of disturbing stimuli. Every trainer of animals knows this from his own experience. Isolation and the patient repetition of stimuli are required to tame wild animals. The totalitarians have followed this rule. They know that they can condition their political victims most quickly if they are kept in isolation. Alone, confused, and battered by waves of terror, a population under an attack of menticide descends into a hopeless and vulnerable state. The never-ending stream of propaganda turns minds once capable of rational thought into playhouses of irrational forces, and with chaos swirling around them and within them, the masses crave a return to a more ordered world. The would-be totalitarians can now take the decisive step. They can offer a way out and a return to order in a world that seems to be moving rapidly in the opposite direction. 
but all this comes at a price. The masses must give up their freedom and cede control of all aspects of life to the ruling elite. They must relinquish their capacity to be self-reliant individuals who are responsible for their own lives and become submissive and obedient subjects. The masses, in other words, must descend into the delusions of the totalitarian psychosis. Totalitarianism, writes Mirlu, is man's escape from the fearful realities of life into the virtual womb of the leaders. The individual's actions are directed from this womb, from the inner sanctum. Man need no longer assume responsibility for his own life. The order and logic of the prenatal world reign. There is peace and silence, the peace of utter submission. But the order of a totalitarian world is a pathological order. By enforcing a strict conformity and requiring a blind obedience from the citizenry, totalitarianism rids the world of the spontaneity that produces many of life's joys and the creativity that drives society forward. The total control of this form of rule, no matter under what name it is branded, be it rule by scientists and doctors, politicians and bureaucrats, or a dictator, breeds stagnation, destruction, and death on a mass scale. And so perhaps the most important question facing the world is how can totalitarianism be prevented? And if a society has been induced into the early stages of this mass psychosis, can the effects be reversed? While one can never be sure of the prognosis of a collective madness, there are steps that can be taken to help effectuate a cure. This task, however, necessitates many different approaches from many different people. For just as the menticidal attack is multi-pronged, so too must be the counter-attack. According to Carl Jung, for those of us who wish to help return sanity to an insane world, the first step is to bring order to our own minds and to live in a way that provides inspiration for others to follow. It is not for nothing that our age cries out for the Redeemer personality, for the one who can emancipate himself from the grip of the collective psychosis, and save at least his own soul, who lights a beacon of hope for others, proclaiming that here is at least one man who has succeeded in extricating himself from the fatal identity with the group psyche. But assuming one is living in a manner free of the grip of the psychosis, there are further steps that can be taken. Information that counters the propaganda should be spread as far and as wide as possible, for the truth is more powerful than the fiction and falsities peddled by the would-be totalitarian rulers, and so their success is in part contingent on their ability to censor the free flow of information. Another tactic is to use humor and ridicule to delegitimize the ruling elite. Or as Mirlu explains, we must learn to treat the demagogue and aspirant dictators in our midst with the weapon of ridicule. The demagogue himself is almost incapable of humor of any sort, and if we treat him with humor, he will begin to collapse. A tactic recommended by Vaclav Havel, a political dissident under Soviet communist rule, who later became president of Czechoslovakia, is the construction of what are called parallel structures. A parallel structure is any form of organization, business, institution, technology, or creative pursuit that exists physically within a totalitarian society, yet morally outside of it. In communist Czechoslovakia, Havel noted that these parallel structures were more effective at combating totalitarianism than political action. Furthermore, when enough parallel structures are created, a second culture, or parallel society, spontaneously forms and functions as an enclave of freedom and sanity within a totalitarian world, or as Havel explains in his book, The Power of the Powerless. What else are parallel structures than an area where a different life can be lived, a life that is in harmony with its own aims, and which in turn structures itself in harmony with those aims? What else are those initial attempts at social self-organization than the efforts of a certain part of society to rid itself of the self-sustaining aspects of totalitarianism, and thus, to extricate itself radically from its involvement in the totalitarian system. But above all else, what is required to prevent a full descent into the madness of totalitarianism 
is action by as many people as possible. For just as the ruling elite do not sit around passively, but instead take deliberate steps to increase their power, so too an active and concerted effort must be made to move the world back in the direction of freedom. This can be an immense challenge in a world falling prey to the delusions of totalitarianism, but as Thomas Paine noted, tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. Truth will set you free. Thank you so much for watching Thin Air Stuff, where I'm sure we're going to find the things that have vanished over time. Please subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, and give me $5 and I'll bet your life. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thanks again for watching. That necklace must be found and at once. I know, Lila, but how? Apparently, they searched the place from stem to stern, even covered the grounds, just vanished into thin air. Thin air? I'll see you there, or at the judgment seat. You take good care, and be kind to others.